National Institutes of Health made a major announcement on stem cells, one that could lead to breakthroughs in the treatment of diseases like Parkinson's, cancer, paralysis. Starting today, scientists who get taxpayer dollars can conduct research on 13 human embryonic stem cell lines that were previously off limits. Many more lines are likely to be approved, but critics of the research say that using the cells, which come from days-old embryos, amounts to destroying human life. Here to help us make sense of the science behind today's announcement is our newsmaker tonight, Dr. Francis Collins. He is the director of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, Dr. Collins, so good to have you here. Appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. Uh, glad to be with you, Campbell. So uh, supporters of stem cell research say that today uh, you know, was a watershed moment. I mean, tell us what's changed with this announcement specifically. Well, today, these 13 stem cell lines, after a very careful review of the conditions that had been previously set forward by the National Institutes of Health, were approved uh, for federally funded researchers uh, to carry out uh, scientific experiments to try to understand what we can learn uh, from these stem cell lines about critical issues that relate to human health. Uh, this has been in the works since last March when President Obama signed an executive order opening up the opportunity uh, for these newer stem cell lines to be used uh, for research funded by the federal government. And today that now comes uh, forward in the reality of having 13 lines and, as you mentioned in the opening, uh, many more not far behind. Now, for those of us who don't know exactly how this works, what is the research potential? Explain it to us for, for just one embryonic stem cell line. Sure. The way these lines are derived is to pick out of an early embryo, and let me be clear, these are embryos that would have otherwise been discarded as part of in vitro fertilization clinic activities. And what one can do is to take a certain type of cell from that early embryo and turn it into a line, which is to say cells that will grow indefinitely in the laboratory and that have the potential to turn into virtually any kind of cell the body might need, a liver or a brain or a blood cell. They can all be derived from one of these stem cell lines. The excitement here is to be able to use those to understand how early steps in human development work and how sometimes they don't work, and to then apply that information to understand diseases better and ultimately to treat things like Parkinson's disease, like diabetes, like spinal cord injury. And, and given that, I mean, that's what, what is often talked about in terms of the areas yeah. of treatment, Parkinson's, uh, spinal cord injuries in particular. So, so does this mean that we are likely to see breakthroughs in, in, in those areas of research? Well, Campbell, that's the big question. There's a great potential here, but frankly, research has not been moving as swiftly as it might in this area because until now, these newer lines derived since 2001 have not been available uh, for researchers who have funding from the National Institutes of Health to work with them. And so the field has not moved with the same kind of speed that it might otherwise have. We really don't know what the potential is here. And I want to be clear that we should be careful not to overstate the likelihood that this approach is going to result in breakthroughs in those diseases. But it is certainly an exciting new pathway, one that's only come along in the last 10 years. And now we have the chance to really push forward and see what can be learned and just how quickly can we test out those ideas of the ways in which this could treat terrible diseases that we currently don't have good solutions for. And to that point, testing them out, you know, people, I, I, I think, understand that most of this research is happening in a lab, uh, not mm -hmm. in people. And how close are you? For, for, for getting us to the next step of, of seeing these treatments out of the lab and, and to patients who may ultimately benefit? Well, in fact, the very first human clinical trial of human embryonic stem cells was approved by the FDA earlier this year. It's a trial being run by a company called Giron, so it's not used federal funding, and it is aimed to try to treat spinal cord injury. Uh, that trial has not yet enrolled its first patient because there are many considerations here about safety, but we are on the pathway towards beginning to test out the potential here in a real human clinical situation, and obviously one of great importance trying to come up with a solution for people who have sustained uh, spinal cord injuries from traumatic uh, experiences. 
Today's stem cell announcement has scientists celebrating, but critics, many scientists celebrating, but critics are outraged that President Obama lifted restrictions on using human embryonic stem cell lines. For them, the bottom line is this. The stem cells come from destroying embryos, and they say that that equals destroying a human life. And my newsmaker tonight says that that is simply not true. But his reasons may surprise you. We're back now with Dr. Francis Collins, who is, again, the director of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, thank you once again for being with us. And obviously, there are a lot of moral and ethical concerns about this. We've been having this debate for quite some time. Um, mm -hmm. but, but explain to us how it works, because the stem cells uh, research I I in how you're approaching it, the embryos you use, they had to meet very specific ethics criteria. Walk us through what that means. And I'm really glad we're having this part of the conversation, Campbell, because I know a lot of people are concerned about whether this kind of research is ethical and whether it violates our long-held and important principles about human dignity and sanctity of life. The way in which these stem cell lines were derived, and they were all derived in the past using non-federal funds, is from, in fact, embryos that are created in the process of in vitro fertilization. You probably, many people listening have encountered couples who have gone through this or they've gone through it themselves trying to be able to have a child. In that process, when one creates those embryos, you generally are, have run the risk of ending up with more than it is safe to implant. And in fact, there are hundreds of thousands of these embryos that are frozen away in in vitro fertilization clinics or that are simply being discarded uh, because that's the wishes of the, the parents and there is no, uh, no reason to keep them in their view. So the question that many ethicists have posed and people both of faith and people who come at it from a different perspective have concluded that in fact, ethically, isn't it more justifiable if those embryos have been created to use them for a purpose that might help somebody with the disease as opposed to simply discarding them. All of the lines that were approved today were derived, in fact, from those excess embryos that otherwise would have been discarded. And it seems to me with that kind of argument, even those who feel strongly about the sanctity of life, uh, when asked to balance the pros and cons of discarding versus trying to do something useful to honor that particular uh, source of human uh, material would say maybe we're better off doing what we've just done. Let, let me also point out that President Bush was the first to approve this kind of use of stem cell lines for federal researchers to work with back in August of 2001. But at that point, a deadline was set that no lines derived after that could be used. That seems perhaps in retrospect a little arbitrary, right. and there are now hundreds of better lines that have come along since then that now can be used by federal researchers. Let me bring your personal view into this, Dr. Collins, because not everyone may know that you are an evangelical Christian, and you have That's written true. that a fertilized egg is uh, very much God's plan, and you've acknowledged that embryonic stem cell research is ethically challenging. Uh, yes. As a scientist, as a believer, how do you grapple with, with that challenge yourself? Well, I would have difficulty with any proposal that involved creating embryos explicitly for research. That seems to cross the line for me personally, not speaking as a representative of the government in this case. But in the circumstance where, as mentioned, the embryos are being created anyway with a benevolent purpose to try to give a childless couple a chance to have a baby, it does seem to me as a believer, as a Christian, that it is more ethically acceptable as long as the consent process was carefully followed and it's clear that there was no payment involved, there was no coercion involved, it was the free gift uh, of the donors to make this available for research. That seems to me to measure up to ethical standards that are quite defensible from whatever your worldview. And, and Dr. Collins, your, your secular critics are, are, are watching you very closely on issues like this. You know, when President Obama picked you, Sam Harris, who is a prominent atheist, wrote in the New York Times, I'm going to read you this quote, um, we, must we really entrust the future of biomedical research to a man who sincerely believes that a scientific understanding of human nature is impossible? What's your take on that criticism? I mean, I mean why are so many people, in your view, uncomfortable with the idea of a man of science also being a man of deep faith? Well, I actually think most people aren't so uncomfortable with that. There's certainly some outspoken critics uh, like Mr. Harris uh, who have taken pen to paper because from their atheistic perspective, they're offended by the idea that there might be any questions that couldn't be answered by a purely scientific, purely nat naturalistic approach. 
But for me, while I think science is the way to understand nature and a powerful tool, and I hope it leads to the revolution in medicine that we are all hoping and praying for, there are some other important questions like, why am I here? And does God exist? And what's the point of life? And how did the universe begin anyway? Uh, that science is not well positioned to ask. Well, isn't it a good thing to ask those questions too? And if so, we need something more than science to go there. We need theology. We need philosophy. We need faith. Dr. Francis Collins, uh, a very interesting conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with us tonight, Dr. Collins. Glad to be with you, Campbell.